Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Homework number eight is due on Thursday. Different day, just kind of keeping you up and on your toes. I added a few more notes at the back or at the bottom of last lecture's notes after class, obviously, actually yesterday and it's on system identification, it will allow you maybe to better understand or do better on homework number eight when you're trying to extract a transfer function from the Bode plot diagram itself. Lab number three is due a week from Wednesday, as are many other of the assignments, and projects or tasks that I would like for you to complete Project, if you're in 541A, is due on the 7th. Teacher course evaluations, apparently you're getting all sorts of emails. Not from me yet, but maybe in a little bit. But that's due also a week from Wednesday. And the final exam is a couple of weeks from tomorrow, I believe, on the 13th of December. It's on a Tuesday, and it's at 1030. What we want to do today is talk about designing controllers using the Bode plot. And the first one that we're going to look at is the phase lag controller. We'll talk a little bit about when we might want to do that, the concept. And since everybody's probably familiar with recipes after this long break, we'll create a recipe for doing this. And actually, Bode plot designs are more recipe based than maybe the root locus. The root locus, you maybe were thinking, oh, what? there's too much flexibility or too much variety, too many ways to solve this. The Bode plot designs are a little bit more prescriptive. You can sort of step through those, but you need to know what you're doing to make that work. And we'll go through an example, and I may have to provide some additional material after class, so stay tuned in terms of Bode or uh, MATLAB material that might be helpful for stepping through the design process. Here's a recap of a phase lag controller, and one of the phase lag controllers that we've already looked at relative to, these are not really new concepts. We've done them in the root locus design. But in the root locus design, one of the controllers that we used quite frequently was maybe a PI controller. There, the pole was actually right on the origin. In this case, it could be at the origin, or probably in, gener in a generic sense, the phase lag controller, the pole and zero are very close to the origin but it's that separation between the pole and the zero that we're interested in to allow us to adjust the gain. But they are very close to the origin, and they are really designed to allow us to enhance the gain, but it can allow us to slow down the system response. Our system may be slower after we introduce the phase lag controller. So if we can tolerate or if, we can, or if we're allowed to slow down the system, if we can accept a slower system, what does that maybe mean in terms of the Bode plot magnitude response? If we can actually tolerate a slower system, what does slower mean relative to the magnitude plot of our Bode diagram? Or how can you translate speed and the Bode plot? Or, hmm, how do I want to say this without giving it away? I'll just give it away. So the 0 dB is a magnitude of 1. And where your gain curve, magnitude curve, is plot crossing that 0 dB line gives you a feel for how fast your system is. If you move that 0 dB crossing frequency to a higher frequency, your system is faster. If you move it to a slower frequency where your magnitude plot crosses 0 dB, you will actually have a slower system. 
So what I'm trying to say here is if we can tolerate a slower system, then that allows us or we can reduce what I will call the gain crossover frequency. That's if it's okay if we slow the system down or its speed. And what we want to do then is really adjust the gain to meet our steady state air spec and then break the gain so that it crosses zero dB at a lower frequency. Let me see if I can write this down. First, we have our magnitude plot in dB and at small frequencies or small omega, we usually want that to be big to get the steady state air that we want. So G of dB at small omega, we want to have it adjusted to satisfy the steady state air condition or specification. That then, in our particular case, sets the magnitude k. So the Bode plot, if we're comparing the Bode plot design with the root locus design, a lot of times we focused on the root locus design with our dominant closed loop poles. We were worried about the transient response and sort of as an afterthought, we checked our steady state air. With Bode plot, we start with trying to fix our steady state air and then we sort of worry about how good our transient behavior is. So we're just sort of flip-flopping those particular desired characteristics. Suppose we have a magnitude plot that looks something like that. And let me put a 0 dB line in here. What did we call this frequency? I typically label this axis omega, but it's log of omega. What did we call that frequency where the gain curve crosses 0 dB, or an actual magnitude sense, your transfer function g, not in dB, but just g, magnitude is 1. What did we call that frequency where the magnitude is 1 or where in dB it's 0 dB? What did we label that? Didn't we call it the gain crossover frequency? That was our omega sub g. And what we also have is we need to worry about our phase curve which may look something like that. And now let me plot my 180 degree line. How do I find my phase margin in this particular diagram, in this situation? No one remembers? What was the question? So here is the phase of G. And the magnitude of G. And we had our stability margins are determined by this magic number, minus 1. Or 1 at an angle of minus 180. So we're actually interested in two different frequencies. We have our gain crossover frequency, and then we have this frequency that may not even exist if our phase never crosses minus 180. But what is this frequency called, or what did we label it? The phase crossover, omega sub p. And then, from those, we look at the two different curves at the same time. Meaning, for omega sub g, that's when our magnitude is 1, and now we want to know how close are we to minus 180. And that will give us our phase margin. When we look at omega sub p, that's where our angle, 
is minus 180, and now we want to know how much can we increase the gain to get our, or to push our gain to a value of 1 or 0 dB, and that's our gain margin. So that right now we have a phase margin of this small amount, and I'm going to call that phase margin uncompensated, PM sub U. And this particular piece, which we're not so worried about in this design, but this is our gain margin. In our case, what we want to do is we want to increase our phase margin. And we are okay if we change this gain crossover frequency to a lower value. And a way to do that, or to make that happen, is to introduce a pole and a zero. If we introduced a pole way back here, and then a zero, do you see that we've now lowered the gain crossover frequency? So that now our new gain crossover frequency, which is we, we will now call this, omega sub c prime, this now allows us to have a much bigger phase margin. And we will call this phase margin compensated. But if we start introducing a pole and zero, does that modify the phase curve? It does, doesn't it? But the phase curve, or the phase, is changed a decade before and a decade after the breaks on our pole and zero. Meaning, a decade before we start introducing the pole, here is where we had our pole, and here is then the zero. But a decade before that pole, we start decreasing our phase, and then a decade before the zero break, our zero phase starts kicking in. And what happens is we want this phase curve to not be too much different than what it originally was in blue by the time we reach our desired phase margin location or the omega sub c prime. And because of that, because we know that our straight line approximations still give us, in our straight line approximations, we're saying this phase has changed over two decades. In fact, it's changed it a little bit more than that in reality. And so at those two decade extremes, it's maybe plus or minus five or six degrees different from the actual zero that we're assuming, or minus nine. This particular distance then we want to accommodate by introducing what we will call a safety margin in our design process or in the recipe. But if we are going to make our gain curve cross at omega sub c prime, we have to lower our gain by this amount. And that's the attenuation that we need to introduce by the pole zero separation. This is then our attenuation that's needed. That's the description with pictures of what we're doing by introducing a pole and a zero to give us a new gain crossover frequency. And what we want to do then are, or to achieve, is the, is the following process or properties by introducing that pole and zero combination. So what we want to do is figure out how do we drop the magnitude curve to allow the new magnitude, which now includes our controller. That's why I now have G sub C G inside the brackets or the vertical bars for our dB to cross 
0 dB at omega sub c prime. And the way that we are going to do that is through this pole and zero combination. So we're going to introduce a pole zero combination with the pole actually at a lower frequency or closer to the origin in our s-plane plot than the zero. But when we're doing that, what we want to do, or really keep from doing, is influencing our phase curve at that crossover frequency. We would really like the phase curve to not change at our new omega sub c prime. We don't want to change the phase curve near this omega sub c prime. With that constraint, if we don't want our phase curve to be changed theoretically at all at omega sub c prime, how far back in frequency do we need our zero to kick in? If we were just thinking in terms of our phase changing one decade before and after the break, and we say it's done, a decade after the break, then we're saying that we really want to have our zero kick in a decade before omega sub c prime. Then once it reaches a decade after omega sub c prime, it no longer is influencing our phase curve. If we do not want to modify our phase near omega sub c prime, then we want to, in our design process, we want to place the controller zero a decade before omega sub c prime. That is, now our controller zero, z sub c, is actually going to be omega sub c prime over 10. Meaning, once we've identified omega sub c prime, we've now located our zero in our controller. It's just omega sub c prime divided by 10. That gets us a decade before omega sub c prime. Then, we need, once we've fixed our zero, now we need to worry about separating that from the pole in order to drop our magnitude curve. What we've now done in the design process is we've now figured out where that zero is. Now we need to figure out how far back do we go in frequency to give us the necessary dip in our magnitude so that we cross the zero dB at omega sub c prime. And that attenuation needed is influenced by how far apart we separate the pole and zero. The controller's pole is at a low frequency lower frequency or a break than the controller zero and the difference or the distance between the pole and the zero or the pole zero separation is determined by the attenuation needed. Those are the two underlying properties of this phase lag controller design. After we've allowed for the selection or determined our gain K to achieve our steady state air spec. So let's now step through this recipe process for designing a phase lag controller with the Bode plot.
And now, g sub c, we're going to assume that our gain has been done prior to finding the zero in the pole. So we're not going to include the gain in our controller. We're already assuming we've set that with our plant, and we've used that to determine our first Bode plot, or the uncompensated Bode plot, as I will refer to it in a minute. But this is now one way of expressing our controller's transfer function in terms of a zero factor in time constant form and a pole factor, and alpha is giving us this separation between our pole and zero. Or if you write it in terms of pole zero form, I'm sorry, in terms of the zero location and the pole location, still in time constant form, we can now identify z sub c as 1 over tau, and p sub c is 1 over alpha tau. These are both in time constant form, but here it's more explicit. And what we're trying to do is simply find tau and alpha. Our zero is determined, z sub c is 1 over tau, where our zero now is at minus z sub c, and the pole is minus, whoops, is at minus p sub c, which is minus 1 over alpha tau, which is also minus z sub c over alpha. We need to then find omega sub c prime after we've fixed the gain k. Then once we know omega sub c prime, we'll find z sub c by just going a decade before omega sub c prime. And then we'll find alpha from the amount of attenuation we need to drop our magnitude plot. Here's our recipe with that notation. And hopefully we have all the ingredients because that's always frustrating to start a recipe and then you run, have to run somewhere to get the flour or the yeast or whatever it is that you're baking. We have everything we need right here. Okay? We have our poles, we have our zeros, and we have our gain. That's what we need. So here we want... to follow the rules for this process. One, the first step is to determine the gain that we need or necessary to achieve what we're required to meet the steady state accuracy achieve the specified steady state accuracy. So if somebody says you need an error of 0.1 due to a constant input, then that will determine what K needs to be. Or if you have a ramp input, they may say, I want your error due to a unit ramp to be 0.1. 05. That will then fix what K needs to be for your particular pole and zeros of your original system. Once you have that gain, now you can actually plot the Bode plot for that gain and the poles and zeros in your system. So plot what I'm now calling the uncompensated, although we have introduced the gain, but by uncompensated, I'm meaning we have no poles or zeros from the controller yet in our Bode plot. So plot the uncompensated Bode plot, which includes magnitude and phase. So I'll say Bode plots using the gain, 0.1, 
that we just determined in step one. Once we have our Bode plots, now you should be able to just read off from the Bode plot your phase margin. And that's what we will call our uncompensated phase margin. So determine the phase margin for the uncompensated system. And that one we're calling P M sub U, phase margin uncompensated. And now we simply have a question to answer. If the uncompensated phase margin, P M sub U, is sufficient, let's say that somebody says, I want a 30 degrees phase margin, and you now read off that P M sub U is 30 degrees, you're done. Then we really do not need to introduce any poles and zeros, we just needed to adjust the gain. No phase lag compensator is needed. And this is the part that you probably like. You can stop the process. But that probably won't happen on the final, will it? Probably the uncompensated phase margin won't be sufficient. And that's then saying otherwise go to step number four. In step four, now what we do is we determine the new gain crossover frequency omega sub c prime. Omega sub c prime is the desired gain crossover frequency. And we can find omega sub c prime from the phase curve that we just sketched when we identify the desired or the corrected or the compensated phase margin, PM sub c. Omega sub C prime is the frequency where the compensated phase margin would be achieved if the gain curve crossed 0 dB at that frequency omega sub c prime. And the phase curve, or I'm sorry, the phase margin compensated is really the phase margin desired. If somebody says, oh, I want a phase margin of 30 degrees, then you actually try to find phase margin compensated based on a safety margin added to that phase margin desired. And here's the fudge factor that we will use. The safety margin is 5 degrees or 10 degrees. That's where you have your design flexibility. But it really depends on how fast your gain curve is sloping, whether or not you want to go with 5 degrees or 10 degrees. But this is our safety margin. In our case, when we were talking about this, we start with the blue curve, 
that's our uncompensated Bode plot. And we say, I'm not happy with this uncompensated phase margin, P M sub U. So we say, well, what would it take to get the phase margin that we want? So we start sliding back, going to a lower frequency, and we say, oh, our desired frequency phase margin is maybe 35 degrees. Let's add another 5 degrees and try to find where our phase curve is 40 degrees bigger than minus 180. So now we're looking at our phase curve. We're trying to find where is it minus 140. And let's just say that that's right here. And now we go up and we find omega sub c prime. That's what we're doing in step four. Step four is just identifying omega sub c prime. Once we've done that, now we can easily lock down our zero of our controller. Now we can place a zero, a decade before, or a, tech, a decade below the desired crossover frequency omega sub c prime determined in step four. Or z sub c, which is one over tau, is now omega sub c prime over 10. So once we found omega sub c prime, boom, we immediately have our controllers locate our zero of our controller located. Z sub c is just now a factor of 10 smaller than omega sub c prime. Once we have that zero located, now we have to find out where do we put our pole. Question. Yes, so when we introduce our pole and zero, we are going to have some new phase, and that's what this green curve is showing on our phase plot. And the reason we're trying, I mean, ideally, we would just push this really far into the lower frequency zone, but it's really not necessary. If we introduce that safety margin of 5 or 10 degrees, then we really only have to locate our zero a decade before that new desired crossover frequency and its phase contribution will have died out or been gone if it's now the break a decade before omega sub c prime. So now in our fate in our root locus design we were now concentrating on the location of our closed loop poles, which was influenced by 1 plus G in the denominator. G now is absorbing my plant and controller. So that that was now saying that our closed loop poles were influenced by 1 plus G of S equaling 0. So G of S equal minus 1 is where our closed loop poles are. Here, we're trying to actually stay away from that in the Bode plot, what you can sort of think of is this magic number of minus 1 is the imaginary axis crossing. And we really don't want to be at the imaginary axis with our closed loop poles. So we're trying to be away from that. And that's what our phase margin and our gain margin indicate. The gain margin and phase margin tell us sort of how far away we are from going unstable in our system. And going unstable was when the actual closed loop poles had a gain of 1 and an angle of minus 180. In the root locus, all of our closed loop poles have an angle of minus 180, but they don't have a gain of 1. So to get us to the stability boundary, we have to have those two playing together. They have to simultaneously be at an angle of minus 180 and a gain of 1. And that's what these two points on our Bode plot are showing us. If, in fact, 
we were at omega sub c prime with our gain, then we could tolerate this much change in our phase before we would get to the magic point of 1 at an angle of minus 180 and be unstable. Likewise, if we now come over to the phase crossover frequency and say how much can we increase the gain before we go through 0 dB, that gives us our gain margin. How much can we crank up the gain? And this one is more readily seen from our root locus. How much could we crank up the gain K before we crossed into the, or into the right half point? And that is our gain margin in this curve. So now what we're trying to do is enhance. And you can see if I continue to draw that magnitude curve, the green curve, we've obviously increased our gain margin also with this design because it would just continue here and now we have a much bigger gain margin than we had with the blue curve. So now we're focusing on this stability these stability margins, our gain margin and phase margin, and trying to enhance those so that our system behaves better. And that's what we're playing with in our Bode plot design. But once we've lo located the zero, now we need to figure out how far apart do we separate the zero and the pole. And that's determined by this red part here showing how much attenuation we need to drop the gain curve in order to get it to cross 0 dB at omega sub c prime. And that will be, let's say, minus 15 dB. It will be a negative number. That's the attenuation needed. Or maybe it's minus 10 dB. Let's now find out how we compute that. So now we want to calculate the pole zero separation using the amount of attenuation needed to cause the magnitude curve to cross the 0 dB line at omega sub c prime. So that now the difference between our pole and 0 will actually give us a change of minus 20 log of alpha. That's the change due to our pole and 0. And we want to now set that equal to the attenuation that we actually need. Where this attenuation needed is a negative number. And then we can simply solve that equation for alpha. The only unknown in that equation, if we plug in minus 15 for the attenuation needed, the only unknown is alpha. Or alpha now is equal to 10 raised to the attenuation needed divided by the minus 20. And again, the attenuation needed is this negative number. Once we have alpha, that's the difference between or the separation between our zero and a pole, now we can calculate or find our pole location. Calculate the compensator pole where it's located using the value of alpha found in step six.
So that P sub C is now Z sub C divided by alpha. Or in terms of the tau, the time constant, that's 1 over alpha times tau. Or if we go back and remember what Z sub C was, which was omega sub C prime over 10, that's now divided by alpha. And we now have our first attempt at our phase lag controller, our G sub C of S, is now 1 plus S over Z sub C over 1 plus S over P sub C. And on the final, that's as far as you'll probably get. You won't be able to check all of this work, but on the homework, you can actually use MATLAB to check if this is actually going to satisfy your design specifications. So in reality, or in practice, you would now draw or introduce this controller and sketch the Bode plot for G sub C G. So draw the compensated Bode plot. Or you're now looking at G sub C of J omega G of J omega and looking to see if your design specs are met. Is the new phase margin large enough? If it is, then you can stop. If it's not, then what do we do? Do we just punt? Probably on an exam you do, but what you can say is you can say, I need to increase my safety margin, so I need to drop my frequency back or change omega sub c, make my omega sub c even smaller than it was. Question? So our omega sub c is not necessarily related to our 2% settling time. It does influence the speed of our system. But this omega sub c prime is in the open loop. This is our open loop transfer function, g and g sub c. We would have to put this in the closed loop, say g over 1 plus g, and see what our closed loop system behavior was. But if we make omega sub c Small, smaller, it will slow down our system. So our 2% settling time will get smaller. And that's indirectly related to this 0 dB crossing in our open loop transfer function. No, so if we, if we make omega sub c prime smaller in frequency, if we go left on our Bode plot, then our system will slow down, which means the 2% settling time will now be longer. So if we had a 2% settling time of 4 seconds, now maybe it's 7 seconds. We've slowed down our system by reducing the gain crossover frequency of our open loop system. And that then needs to put in, be put into our closed loop transfer function, which is now this G sub C G over 1 plus G sub C G. All of that, if we don't meet our spec, is to decrease omega sub C prime, or another way of thinking of that is to say that we could increase our safety margin in step four, and then we simply return to step five. And I know a lot of you like to iterate and get in this infinite loop. Hopefully it won't be an infinite loop where you would continue to adjust this omega sub c prime. Let's look at an example or start to see about how we would walk through some of these steps. <laughs> 
Suppose that somebody now gives us a system, g of s, that's 10k over s, 0.1s plus 1, and 0.05s plus 1. And that's already in time constant form. But where are your poles? Can you see where your poles might be relative to that particular system? Do you have any finite zeros? Do you have any values of s in the numerator that if you set those equal to some number, that g of s would vanish? No. So you have no finite zeros. What's your pole zero excess? 3. Where's your phase going to end up at large frequencies? Minus 270. Where's your phase beginning at low frequencies? It's not at 0, is it? It's starting at minus 90 because we have that pole at the origin. So those are some checkpoints that you can put on yourself if you sketch this in MATLAB and you can look at your phase curve and see immediately, oh, it started at 0, it should have started at minus 90 degrees. I've done something wrong. I've input my information wrong or used MATLAB incorrectly. Suppose the design specs now, so if we had this and we, so stepping back a little bit, if we had this system and we put it in a closed loop configuration, our unity output feedback configuration, and it was stable, and I applied a constant input, what would my steady state error be to a constant input if my closed loop is stable for this system? What would my error be due to a constant input? It's going to be zero because we have an integrator, a pole at the origin, we have a type 1 system. So we have a pure integrator in our system. We put this in a closed loop. If it's stable, if our closed loop is stable, you put in a constant and your output's going to track that. It's going to eventually get there after the transient. And you'll have zero steady state error. So in this system, it means that to determine what k is, it's going to matter more about our steady state error due to a ramp and not a constant. A constant, it's going to be zero. For a ramp input, let's say that we want our steady state error to be less than 0 0.03333. I'm stuck. Let's just say it goes on. And let's say now that we want our steady state error due to a ramp to be 0.03 and we want our phase margin to be bigger than or equal to 30 degrees. And the first step in this whole process is to first find k. And to find k, we'll, we will use this steady state air specification. Do you remember how the air due to a ramp is related. This is now step one. Our steady state error is actually 1 over k sub v. And we want that to be less than or equal to 0 0.033. Or this now says, what do we want k sub v to be? If we solve that for k sub v, we want k sub v to now be bigger than 30. And this is our velocity gain constant. The case of V is nowhere in our system. We have to relate that to K. In our system, we can find case of V. That was now the limit as S goes to zero of S G of S. If we multiply g of s by s and let s go to zero, what happens? We multiply by s and it cancels the pole at the origin. And then we let s go to zero. What happens downstairs? Everything goes to one so that we just end up with what's in the numerator. Meaning k sub v in this case is actually 10k and we want that to 
to be bigger than or equal to 30, let's not push our limit. Let's just say, let's just set it equal to the smallest value, which really you would probably want it to be a little bit bigger than the smallest, but let's just say 30 for now. Or this now tells us exactly what k needs to be in our transfer function. And once we have k, we can sketch the Bode plot, and then we can just proceed with our steps. And I'll try to maybe do this offline and post that in addition to these notes so that you can then follow through what's going on with a phase lag controller design.